Welcome to Season 2 of Voices of Value, a conversation between Peter Kakos and Rick Rushton and their high-achieving guests from professional sport, Olympians, business leaders and ordinary people with value hacks to share through simple life lessons. If you're keen to reach your next level personally and professionally, sit back and join the conversation with your hosts, Rick and Peter. Welcome to Voices of Value. This is Peter Kakos here, my good friend Rick Rushton. And Rick, we are coming from the the hallowed corridors of Cricket Australia. And the headquarters of Cricket Australia, yep, absolutely, with absolute cricket royalty, Pete. So it's part of our Empowering Women series that we've been so thrilled to be bringing to our subscribers. Yep, absolutely. And we've got some great feedback already from um, from these empowering, inspiring women that we have. And we're going to continue it today. And I've got to say, I am really excited <laughs> about our special guest, Belinda Clark. So Belinda, welcome. And Rick, join us. Do the intro for Belinda. Absolutely. So Belinda Clark, for those who are uninitiated with cricket to a degree and may be watching this on YouTube, you'll see that uh, Belinda is a very bright, bubbly, energised lady who had a stellar career uh, that involved captaining her country for more than a decade and a half, was setting records in the women's cricket game, came up through the ranks at a time when cricket was really dominated by men in many respects. And so uh, to actually lead her country, hit some first. She was the first first uh, cricketer to have a double century in a 50 over one day. Male or female. Male or female. Mm-hmm. We think we need to n- sort of note that. Uh, she captained her country, obviously, uh, won a World Cup, won plenty of series. I could keep on going on, but if we went through all of her achievements, Pete, this interview would be done for time. <laughs> so what we should say, though, is is that it is Belinda Clark AO. She has been honoured for her absolute participation and work in cricket. She is a member of the Sports Australia Hall of Fame. Uh, she is often and she hates it but I'm going to say it anyway she is known as the female Dom Bradman but more importantly Pete I think if you're really good at doing it those who do it do it those who can't coach it uh, those who can do both are pretty unique those who can do those two things and then post cricket go into a stellar career as an elite leader at the highest levels within Mm. her industry of Cricket Australia there are three areas we can tap into when we bring to the microphone the wonderful the talented the overachieving let's be honest Belinda Clark thanks guys it's great to be here yeah, it's great. To, look, Belinda, you uh, you captained Australia from um, 1994 to 2005. So I'm interested, first of all, to hear about you know how that went from a from a leadership sense. Was that destiny for you to captain Australia? Was it something you set out for as, as a as a young teenager, or was it something that was bestowed upon you out of the blue? Or talk to us about these younger sort of formative sort of years to that point. Yeah, it certainly wasn't something that I was um, coveting. So I. Um I was very lucky to be involved in a cricket club um, when I moved to Sydney. So I grew up in Newcastle. I moved to Sydney to go to university and I was playing in a cricket club with Christina Matthews who um, is now CEO of the WACA. At that point she was working for Women's Cricket Australia as coaching and development manager and she was captain of our club team. Uh, And I very quickly moved through the ranks of sort of club, state and national. So I played for my state and the country in the same year, sort of within a, within weeks of each other. Um, and she was there always just sort of in the team as a wicketkeeper, but helping, sort of helping and guiding as I was going through that. And then two years later, they said, um, would you like to captain the club team? I said, why don't you do it? You're the better captain. And she said, I think you, it'd be good for you. So I did it. And then that year I captained the state and I captained the country again, all within sort of weeks. So um, I was blessed by watching and seeing someone do it really well. Um, the previous captain, Lynn Larson, was awesome and she was in the teams that I continued to play with and she um, probably had to swallow a bit of pride and sort of jump in behind and she was she was great as well. So it was a quick rise to fame um, yeah. and that was good because I didn't have any time to think about it. Um, so I was <laughs> running on gut instinct, which was probably the way to do it. So your, your the skill level was that a was that a natural skill? Do you think in in the cricket, or was it? You know, did you have this innate ability to to strike the ball well? And you did a bit of bowling as well. But, but let's talk about the batting. You know, first and foremost, I mean, all the all rounding, if you if you like. But the skill and how did you hone that? How did you get great at that? Uh, I um, I played a lot of different sports when I was growing up, and I was just always lucky to be around people that were great role models. So whether it was at a hockey club, um, whether it was at a tennis club, um, I played indoor cricket growing up in Newcastle as well. And I was just blessed with these people that came in and out of my life that gave me opportunities and then gave me feedback. Um, 
So I feel like I was always a pretty good athlete. I could do stuff. Um, and when you can do stuff, you get chances because you're always going to be in the team. So I was, I don't think I've ever been dropped from a team and that's not being conceded. It's just people that are in those situations often get leadership chances. And yeah. I was just through my teenage years and into my um, you know, early 20s, I was just um, really lucky to get those opportunities. And I think it's fair to say in most sports, if you're captain, you probably toss the coin and that's about the end of it. But in mm. cricket, you, there's so much more involved in being the captain of the team. Prior to the age of professional coaching, the captain kind of almost ran most of the training sessions. You toss the coin, you make strategic decisions about whether you bat or bowl. You're always thinking in the game, even if the ball's not coming to you, you're thinking about what's going on. Concentration levels must have been huge. Strategic thought process had to be high. And you said you went from really zero to hero in a fairly short period of time. You had to go on gut instinct. What sort of prepared you for that? Were you good at strategic games like chess? Did you have a have a real competitive mindset what, what do you think was the driving force there uh probably i'm not good at chess or checkers <laughs> or anything like that um i would always uh, i watched a lot of sport on the television um when i played sport i was fascinated with the strategic element so whether it was um, on a tennis court you know what's the best way to get into this opponent's head how do i upset their rhythm um and standing in the field for hours and hours in a cricket um if if you're not thinking about what do i need to do here or what do we need to do in order to create some changes in this game um then you're probably going to get bored so i was always thinking from whatever position I was fielding, why aren't we doing X? Yep. And then the captain would make mm. their move and I would talk to them afterwards, why did you do that? Um, so that's the learning, I suppose. If you're interested, it's sort of sitting in and around you. Um, and I was always interested in what should our next move be. I've always been curious about that is is because it is such a long game, cricket, and how do you mentally stay tuned and, and focused and, you know, and, and on the right wavelength to make these, you know, compelling decisions? Is there any little secrets you'd... I've, I've got one. Uh, yeah. One secret. Um, when the proverbial is hitting the fan, um, I find it really helpful to try and put myself back on the lounge chair watching watching through the television. So um, I would put myself in a position where I wasn't, like I wasn't at slip, for example. I pulled myself out of there and I basically tried to get a helicopter view of what is going on here, who is thinking what, how are we operating. If I was sitting at home watching this, what would I be thinking about? What are we doing? Mm. Um and I had to do that a number of times in matches, but in big matches I did it a few times and it just gave me the space to think more clearly. It's a great lesson though, it's, isn't it's it? It's a visual observation, isn't it? And, you know, you, we already heard Belinda say in this interview thus far that she observed what good captains did, that she was fortunate to play under, play with, and then ultimately that ability to just bring yourself out of the absolute inertia of the game and have a helicopter view and see what's going on and have a, a wider view. Just look up, just look up and elevate your thinking around the vision of what you're seeing, which I think is fundamentally important. Yeah. Let's not, let's not, um, I'm not sure if you mentioned in the intro, Rick, about the Order of Australia Medal. So, and we asked Chloe this as well, but I must ask you, what's it like having a couple of letters after you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's pretty good. I actually haven't, um, I haven't got it on my signature on my work emails, just because oh, I feel like people think I'm a bit of a knob. So um, <laughs> the first thing I'm I, um, I have it tattooed on my yeah, forehead just uh, in case. But very, um, very humbling. And I think because um, getting an award within your sport is one thing, but getting an award. Um, that is a, across the community, um, that is whole another level. And yeah. it just really, um, you see the types of things people are doing to make life better for others. And you think, wow, that there's some really clever people out there. And um, I'm sitting amongst them. Um, you sort of feel a little bit <clears throat> like you shouldn't really be there. But um, yeah, just an amazing opportunity to, to connect with people that are doing great things in the community. Mm. Not to mention to have a medal named after you. And, you know, a lot of people would certainly know the great Alan Border and, and the medal there. But then there's the Belinda Clark medal, which has you know, just become just so uh, so prevalent and, and coveted, um, coveted, coveted. If you oh, hear incredible. Alyssa's acceptance speech, she's just so thrilled to that. Have was an that. amazing speech. It was yep. a very, very mm. good one. And I think the other thing is, is that that's what we said in the introduction, which I did mention the Order of Australia. Sorry, Clearly, yeah, we're, yeah, as you, no, just, what happens with Pete Belinda, just so you're aware, <laughs> when his lips stop moving, he stops listening. But uh, it's important to sort of know that we do have the calibre of this person here. But uh, when you finish playing, which we shouldn't just gloss over, that was an amazing career. Is it now that you look back and go, that wasn't – because when you're doing it, it's kind of almost the sort of thing you think, I'll think about that later at the end. Do you look back on your how – do you, how, how do you look back on your career now? Uh, I feel like it's someone else's career. So it, it's um, 
15 years now, I think, yep. be, be, uh, when I finished playing um, internationally. And from that point on, I've never played another game of cricket. So I basically hung up the uh, the boots in the change room at uh, Taunton. I left them there and Lisa Kitely finished on the same day as well and our <laughs> boots were left hanging hanging really? at Taunton. And um, I've since been back there and I'm, they're, they're not, my boots aren't still there. Um, <laughs> they sold them for a yeah, lot of money. They're on yeah, eBay. <laughs> yeah. um, and so – I feel like it's um, it's so distant from now that it just feels like it was someone else doing it. And when you're in it, you are just worried about the next tour, the next training session. It's very, very clear what you're striving for, very clear what the next move is, where the next trip's to. Um, and then you finish and you sort of get a bit lost because all that structure is sort of gone um, and you get to choose where you go for holidays, which is totally... Mm-hmm. Perfect. So yeah. when Cricket Australia comes to you and says, um, okay, you finished, but we really want you now to run the, our Centre of Excellence up in Brisbane, was that an easy, seamless transition for you? Did you think, yeah, I'm destined to do that? Or did you think, hang on, I might want to just see what else is out there? Or was it just a, a very straightforward move? Uh, well, I was already working for the organisation um, in another in another role. And before that last tour, um, James Sutherland had a discussion with me and said, look, what are you thinking of doing with your playing career? And I said, um, at the end of this Ashes, I'll be done. Uh, he said, okay, well, if that's the case, and this is sort of three months out, um, would you be interested in um, doing this or would you rather stay and work in this other area? And um, it didn't take me long. I was like, no, that'd be great. And it's a move to Brisbane. And so I got home from England. Um, I packed a, another cricket bag um, and I took a flight up three days later and I started work in, in Brisbane um, with Tim Nielsen as the head coach up there at the time and just started a, another chapter of, of um, a professional career. And that was so you had gone from developing the game as a you know for women and girls to then going up to you know the centre of excellence to really find the next group coming through and give them the benefit of your wisdom and that sort of scenario. But you were always a pretty prevalent administrator too, weren't you? So you you were kind of unique. The, the players normally play and go into media. They really keep continuing that role of developing the game from a higher plane and a higher thinking. And I think it gets back to that thought you have about elevating yourself out of the game and having a helicopter view. You weren't just looking at the game per se you're looking at the where the whole industry was going so you had some thoughts there ahead of time didn't you yeah look I think um for me personally it was really important that I um created um knowledge and experience beyond the women's game and this was my chance to do that so looking after both the men's and women's programs um nurturing the next layer of male talent that was coming through um connecting with different people that was really important to me and then I sort of went back into the women's game a little bit and then I've sort of come back out and now working in community. So I think you can have your biggest impact when you are working across as broad a platform as you can because you talk to the people that make the key decisions and that was the logic there that I can actually do more for the women's game by being mm. involved across both than just solely striving um, through one element. Um, in recent times, Belinda, you were um, – you the magnificent award um, bestowed upon you in in terms of the AFR's top 100 uh, influences. Um, Influences is something that Rick and I, you know, often talk about and we just – we're just craving, you know, more information around that and what makes people tick and, and, and how this influencing sort of, you know, comes about and, and what are the tips because, you know, most of the people that listen to this podcast are uh, are leaders in their business or leaders in their lives in, in, in some way, shape or form, whether that's at home or yeah. um, or, or in business. What does influencing mean for you and, and, and how do you live your life? Like what, what's what's important to Belinda Clark? Um. Deep questions, aren't they? Yeah, wow. Um, What's important to me? Um, Family, fun and fitness. That's sort of the first first three that are um, absolutely critical. Um, And then it's about trying to clear a path for people in the next next generation, whether that be boys or girls, um, but influencing the adults of the world to clear a path for the next generation. That's really what drives me on a daily basis. So that means um, from an influencing or leadership perspective, what are the things that I do on a daily basis that role model the things that I want to see? Um, I'd much rather do than say. Um, and as I've gone through a career, I've worked out you've also got to say. So my whole leadership journey has essentially started from what is it that I want to do and want mimicked? And that's about, you know, being kind to people, making sure that you're listening, diversity of thought, um, sort of extracting um good ideas and being able to discuss them. And that's just a continual journey because it changes Mm. every time the group you're working with changes. Um, So they're they're the things that that drive drive me and I think um, my leadership basically comes from that role modelling strongly, do as do as I do is, a, is the starting point for, for anything that I 
that I start. Yeah. Let's talk about challenges and adversity, Rick, and we, yep. we spoke about that um, off air. Yep. Do you want to lead us down that path? Well, I just think back to that time when, you know, anyone who follows Australian cricket, male or female, doesn't really have to have too much of an understanding about Australian cricket to understand that we went through a challenging time, a controversial time when in a very competitive tour in South Africa, and we started off that series 1-0 up, and we were, we were really sort of in the faces of the South Africans. And we, we all know about this sandpaper gate and as to how that led to what uh, happened next it's kind of really it was a it was a moment that probably seemed like that seemed to be the catalyst for everything else but it seemed to me to be the tipping point on a lot of other things brewing underneath and it finally came to the forefront of Australians falling out of love with their Australian cricket team which mm. is almost unheard of I mean it's our national sport it's an Australian institution and when yeah. someone's cheating in the world we go well that would be another country that wouldn't be our country you know we don't do that and then when we find out that our captain knows about it and, and steers away from it when our vice captain's leading it and other players are involved it makes everyone go what's going on here it led to some amazing changes in the sense that you know we lost our captain we lost our vice captain they were suspended for a long period of time and uh, I think the most important thing that I want to sort of cover with Belinda is that it had a massive effect inside these four walls here at Cricket Australia. Our CEO left after a long-term appointment, let's be candid. And as you mentioned earlier, James Sutherland could see you coming towards the end of your, your career and wanted to set a, a seamless pathway through to keep your talent within these four walls. He ended up going. Kevin Roberts was yet to be appointed. There was a massive gap at leadership at the top and someone stood up and said, okay, here we go. And, and in your typical manner, follow me, let's get going here. Talk us through, uh, first of all, um, that circumstance, the challenges thereof, and how did you lead in those challenging times? Um, so that was a um, – it was really challenging because um, – I had worked very closely with Pat Howard, um, who head um, of performance, head of performance, performance yeah. and um, am still very good friends with him. So um, that that was difficult in itself because he'd just exited um, the organisation. He wasn't going to renew his contract, so that they brought that forward, and so um, that then sort of put me in a position where I was working back with the people that I'd been working with um, sort of two years prior, um, and into a situation where everyone was sort of shell shocked. Really, the the department was shell shocked. The team was shell shocked. Um, we'd just appointed Justin Langer as the head coach. Um, Pat and James had done that, and I think made an amazing selection. Um, and Justin's paid paid them back in spades, really. Um, so it was a difficult time, and um, I'm not. I wouldn't say that it was um, an easy time. It was probably two or three months of um, torture, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because. You could see these people were trying to do the right thing but second-guessing themselves and expectations they thought had changed and no one knew really where they stood and I was going to be interim, so how long are you going to be here and <laughs> what are you going to do, um, you know, and, and who's coming next? And so it was just sort of we were caught up in this whirlwind of change and people were reasonably uncomfortable. So um, the strategy was um, just to really focus in on the key things that we could change and that needed to be worked on over that period and connect in with the people that I knew were great people trying to do great work and empowering them to to go and do their do their work. Some of them were in Brisbane, some of them were on the road with the team, um, but getting really clear on th the only thing that matters are A, B and C. Mm. The rest of it, keep going, but we are going to change these things. So, you know, regular meetings with them, give them um, transparency in what, what, what's happening above them um, and giving them a, a say in the decisions. So, Love that. Love, so that. The, love, the, love the empowering yep. aspect of that, yep. you know, because you, you start to second guess yourself when it may not have been you but you get directly affected by that. Mm. The spotlights come on. The national spotlight comes on and then you just you, – you are literally like that deer in the headlights metaphorically, mm. yeah? Well, and I think what happens is when someone's exiting the building at a lower scale, let's just say someone who might be a part-time administration person or an IT person, no one blinks an eyelid. But when we're talking the CEO, the uh, manager of high performance, uh, some pretty high-key administrators, everyone's thinking, gosh, you know, last one out, you know, turn off the lights, what's going on here? Uh, I'm interested to know what those big rocks were of ABC when you said let's just focus in on ABC. What were what was two or three of the key focus areas that you got your team to really just get really clear on those things? What were they? Yep. So um, from a, a men's team perspective, um, what, what was critical um, was that they had the support they needed and the right people around them in order to push forward. So Tim Payne was doing a great job. Justin Langer was doing a great job. Um, the other support staff um, needed a little bit of 
reshaping. So there was that issue that needed to be dealt with. So that was like uh, really important. And then the second thing was we needed to find a way of integrating Steve and Dave and Cameron back into the team. So that became a key piece of work. Um, if it wasn't going to be done in January, it wasn't going to work in July. So they were the two things from a men's team perspective. Uh, the women's team um, was also embarking on some um, you know, in some big tournaments, they were well led, they were well coached, and they had a steady support staff. So they were essentially were business as usual. Please keep going. Don't let me disturb you. Go for your life. <laughs> um, and the third thing really was trying to get a better understanding of um, system wise, what is it that the states and territories are after that they're either not getting, or that we thought we were all on the same page as that we worked out that we weren't. So just getting a state of play with the relationships and the things we had in place with states and territories, mm. because if they're not happy or feeling like they're contributing contributing, um, then, then it creates problems sort of elsewhere. So that, they were the three, three big rocks that we, we needed to address. Do you think it was, um, and, and, and I'm probably delving, I don't know how deep I'm allowed to go here, but would it be an, an athlete issue more than an administration issue? Would it be 50-50? Would it be one more than the other? Or where did you think this, the, the issue stemmed from of what happened? Uh, look, I think, um, I think the, the main issue that was worked through it, that came out as, um, you know, people doing the wrong thing on the field uh, was was simply just losing perspective and not understanding. Um, when you are away in that group, it is really easy to get caught up in what you think is important. And I think just as a collective, um, that's where they had arrived at. And this was the wake up call to say, you know what, this is a game of cricket. Um, mm. You're in a very privileged position. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you better represent your families and your, your people as well as you can. And so that was Tim, Tim Payne's philosophy, it was Aaron Finch's philosophy and it was Justin Langer's philosophy. So they, they had already shifted to that. Yeah. It was a matter of reinforcing it and supporting them in, in that shift. Hmm. It's interesting and, and, and let's, when we, we come out the other side and, and the Ellen Border medal, as we said, and as long as, along with the Belinda Clark medal that was awarded um, during the week, at the start of the week, and... You have Dave Warner yeah. get up there and um, and it certainly didn't go unnoticed that he mentioned the name Belinda Clark as someone who was influential. It's quite emotional for him. Um, you know, the athletes and what they went through, I'd, I'd love to sort of get your, you know, mm. an, an, an idea on, on, on the mindset that sort of went on after that and how do you get them out the other side. So in a business sense, you know, when, when people have their uh, – you know, this this was monumentally silly, mm. but um, but there are plenty of people in business who do silly things, and then how do you get them out the other end, and and with that support, because you know these are human beings. Mm. You know, people make mistakes so, and so yeah. forth. But when with the national spotlight, as we said, <laughs> it becomes um, you know, really compelling. Yeah, I, I think um, so. What what did we do? We called in an expert um right. to help us navigate through what was um highly emotional, um had massive impacts on people's lives and we essentially needed to allow people space and time to consider and think and talk to each other around how do we want to move from where we are today, what does success look like and what support do I need for all of us, what what support do we all need in order to arrive where we want to arrive. So they were all very committed to the end point which was we want a very happy, performing, connected team. So that, that was easy to work out yeah. um, and then it was really just um, allowing them the space and the time to, to work their way through that. So no, like no no different to anyone else, um, yeah. a family dispute, yeah. um, dust up with your mate, whatever, um, you generally need some mechanism to stop, reflect, think, understand other people's perspective and ultimately um, it's just a human, human connection thing that it bit by bit came good. So that was missing? That was missing pre-BC? That was yourself? Do you think that was that was a really big gap? Well, I think the um, the, 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 when you lose perspective, you think of yourself first and others second. Mm. When you have perspective and you understand what you're trying to do, you think of the group first and the individual second. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, you know, and individuals are within that. So um, understanding that everyone's human, everyone makes mistakes, everyone wished that it hadn't happened, um, but yeah. understanding other people's perspectives and emp empathetically listening to how that how that has impacted on them um, yeah. essentially became the path forward. 
And it's not win at all costs. There was a price to pay if you're going to win, a, win that way. And so therefore we're saying let's just have some unified common values. That it's, it's, not, it's not me, it's us, it's not you, it's we. And, and together we're going to actually be aware of the fact that there's 25 million people in Australia, probably 20 million love the Australian cricket team. You guys are one of 11 representing, I don't know what the math is of the population there, but you're 0.01% privileged. Make sure yeah. you carry yourself in that same way. We're not wanting you to be less competitive. We just want you to actually you know, follow the spirit thereof, which I think has always been maybe a, a known, but somewhere it just seemingly got lost as we went through that sort of transitional period of, you know, probably being dominated by the Windies in the 80s and then, you know, the, obviously after World Series cricket and the reemergence and, and away we go again and all of a sudden we're winning and then it's almost like Australian cricket team talks about mental disintegration. Where does that then go over the line to bullying or where does that go across the line to so many other different things? And I think that's what you're talking about, just getting everyone – very clear that you know here is the situation and I think the best thing is that those three players you mentioned slightly different penalties for Steve Smith to obviously Cam Bancroft to then you know Davey Warner but they're all told the door is closed for now but not shut permanently you know if you display these things you, you know you're more than welcome you, your talent will get you back but we need you talented back with a group mindset as well is that something that you think was the real win out of that particular experience for the whole group not just those three players but indeed all of our players men women and you know, from little kids in the park yeah and that that needs to be led and um Justin Langer was an uh, absolute critical person in this because day to day um, you sometimes need a reminder of I'm on track, I'm off track and he um, he just did that beautifully in terms of just being there and thereabouts the whole time mm. reminding people, hang on a minute, this is what we agreed to, you're off track a little bit or um, without without sounding like a, um, a policeman on it, he very genuinely um, steered, steered the group through that. So the credit credit really on a day-to-day basis should rest with with him and um and the captains of the team and the, the team management they did a wonderful job yeah so you'd be proud of that and the other thing is someone listening to this as a leader says okay well if i talk to my guys about something they just kind of go oh, okay well there, there you go but if it's you know, justin langer talking to a cricketer they look at him and go well he's been there he's done that i'm going to follow him to that you know to the letter uh, where's the challenge for say a belinda clark giving some feedback to a, a female saying well but you're belinda clark I'm Jane Smith. I don't really, you know, like it might be easy for you to do that. It's very hard for me to do that. You know, how do you communicate a standard of behaviour or something you want your person or persons to aspire towards without coming across as me talking down to you directing versus collaboration? I see more for you than you see for yourself. How do you, how do you get them to sort of see that more as a, not Belinda Clark, the, the person, the stature, the status, the track record, but Belinda Clark, the person who wants the best for you? How do you get that across? Um, it's something I've had to learn um, and essentially it's around asking questions and um, trying to get the other person to paint some different pictures for themselves. Uh, for themselves. So um, it's all well and good if, um, if I'm telling them how to play a cover drive. Um, it's a very different um, discussion if you're asking them to play in a different way or you're actually asking them to tackle a problem in a different way. So providing um, a podcast to listen to or a book to read or a, um, you know, someone to talk to that's different to spark an interest or a curiosity in something um, and then you can have a conversation with them and when they ask for your point of view Mm. you might be able to share it but um, try not to share your view up front or directly um, until they're ready to um, listen and, um, you know, explore different ways because I know that my answer is not always – it's often not right. Mm. Um, it's just one opinion and I think that's one thing I learnt with captaincy of a cricket team. Um, people can criticise a decision a captain makes on a cricket field but you never get to play out the alternative that the, the person in the lounge chair thinks is the answer. <laughs> yeah, right. So the only one that gets tested is the one that I took. Um, <laughs> yours is untested. Um, yeah, and so I've taken point. this um, through life. So my opinion is my opinion and it's um, the alternate opinion is untested unless it's you that's actually making the decision. So mm. being open that there's a million different ways to skin a cat um, and you've got to be open to try, try multiples. But people that have lots of opinions and never have theirs implemented, I'm always wary of... Um, of it as well, you know, that's one, one way to do it, but yeah, there's, yeah. there's always but you've got to back way. yourself and yeah. got to have that confidence to actually do that if you're leading, don't you? Because yeah. people are looking for an answer, mm. not like a, well, it could be this. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it feels like to me we should go this way. That yeah. doesn't really inspire me. Yeah. I think it's really great that, uh, and I like to call it, you know, keeping your powder dry. I think it's great that you're not, 
spewing information, if you mm. like, on onto the or, or direction and so forth, instead mm. of going, well, where are they really at? Are they ready for this information yes, yet, right. or, do, or do they need that that podcast, that book, like you said? I think that's really, really cool. Yeah, um, just to open insight. them up. Are they ready for the information? Because you yeah, know, you've prepared them, pre-framed them, and just said, let's just you know talk about this when you're ready to probably receive the information, as opposed to you know broadcast the best solution and they're just wide shut to it because they're not ready for it. I guess mm. so. That's part of the leadership to a to a degree. I always love Steve War's uh, autobiography where he talked about as captain, you'll take all these opinions and you get feedback from your players, but ultimately then you got to go with your gut. And it sounds to me like you're a very intuitive leader. You'll you'll sort of sense what you you've taken in all the information and the information might say let's go with plan a but your gut says i just feel like plan b might be the way to go say you're in that situation in an administrative role so all the data says we have to zig you're thinking we've got a zag here how do you communicate that back to your team knowing that they might look and go is she reading the same excel spreadsheet (laughs) i'm reading how do you do that one because i know you've done that more than once in your career so how do you how do you yeah how do you communicate that um yeah, I mean that's that's tricky, but I think um, gut instinct generally comes from past experience. So there's always something that's in the back that's leading the gut a certain way. So it's not like it's just coming from nowhere. So trying to come back to um, the logic of why do why do I think I'm thinking that way, or what what is it that I think is wrong with the information we've collected? Like we haven't actually dug in deep enough, or we haven't taken a humanistic view of this. Like what what actually is at the back of that? Um, and trying to explain. We, if you don't convince them that it's the right way to go, it's sort of null and void anyway. Yeah, right. So um, if you can't get them over the line, um, you've got two options. One, we're going anyway and if you don't want to come, get off the bus. Yep. Um, or um, I'm going to keep keep working through this and be able to answer all the questions you've got before I can understand that you're actually on the bus and we're, and we're going together on this. So, so you're letting them know you're giving it – as they're looking at the Excel spreadsheet and the data and they're making a decision, you're also looking at some solid data but it's from past experience and you just want to explain that back to them so that they understand it. It's not like you've gone, my astrologist says we should go this way because that's my lucky number today. It's not that. You've really got a sense that – I hear the data, I see the data, I understand the data, but I get a sense we're going to go this way. That's what a lot of our leaders in the industries that we work in mm. a lot at the moment are thinking, data saying one thing, I feel like I want to go this way. How do you explain that so the team's all on board? I think what you're saying is just give them enough reference points to let them understand you're making a solid decision too. It's just data they're not tuned into at the moment, but it's something you've experienced through your life. Yeah, and there's other. There's always another industry or another person that's been through or is about to tackle what you're about to tackle. So I'm very interested in I, I read I listen I um, explore stuff that's like well someone else has had to solve this what industry would have tried to have solved this in a different way because it's very easy no different to losing perspective as a cricketer it's very easy to lose perspective working in the sport as well around this is this is a batch of past experiences and this is the data and let's plow forward it's like well you know what there's a batch of stuff that's happening in the world about digital um, transformation of things about how people are connecting communities about how what's happening with volunteerism that happens in you know a whole range of different fields and I think what we're getting better at is tapping into that and Mm. um, being curious about what what else is happening out there Mm. and who who's been through this before because we're obviously not the first ones that have done this no we're and I love the inquisitiveness Pete that's kind of clearly why Belinda finds more answers than she needs because she's looking for more things you know most people are just pigeon you know just just so narrow with their focus to a degree we're on the eve of the World Cup T20 for women, which you're incredibly uh, excited about and passionate about, and it's it's really getting underway in many res- many respects. Most of the teams are here; they're playing, they're acclimatising. We expect to be in the final at the MCG. That's fundamentally important. Talk to mm-hmm. talk to us about that goal, about uh, the the ninety thousand goal. You want to sort of really make sure that all of our subscribers, if we if we just give our listening audience and viewing audience, uh, we'll have we'll have a bay or two covered, wouldn't we? Yeah, it's, look, it's not just about Katy Perry either, Rick. It's, that's it's right. about the cricket. <laughs> it's about Okay. Okay. Yeah, all right. It's, it's about the cricket. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Perry times two. So Elise and Katie. Yes. Um, I love that. Yeah, really exciting. And um, tournament uh, starts on the 21st of Feb in um, Sydney Showgrounds with Australia India and a big opening ceremony. And then I suppose the finale then becomes the MCG with, uh, again, an act, which will be Katie Perry and um, and hopefully a full full stadium. Uh, essentially, amazing. yeah, mm. essentially to signal to the world, you know, this, this thing that women and girls play sport is here to stay um it's great it shows that we've got um equality um people should have a choice to play sport 
whether they're male or female and this is really just showing showing the world um, that this is what we believe in and hopefully Australia will get behind it. Yeah, and you're into game development, community cricket, obviously. Your, your passion is making sure that the game of cricket is open, not just to in our generation growing up. It was really, you know, little boys and if you played with a girl, that was almost – you looked at that and thought, hmm, they should be easy to beat. Now we're actually seeing cricket right across the spectrum from classes of, uh, you know, middle class, lower class, high, upper – it doesn't matter. The game is – Available to everybody. I know you're passionate about that, not just boys and girls, but also people from diverse backgrounds and those that probably don't naturally have the opportunity to play cricket. Just, just give us a, a quick synopsis on that because I know you're passionate about that. Yeah, so I think um, sports um, a great way of bringing people together and understanding each other's differences and similarities and um, integrating, using sport to integrate communities, I think is absolutely critical. So there's two parts to it. There's the physical activity part, which sport provides, and, and um, then there's the, you know, the connection the emotional connection with people um, and cricket's a great game for both those things so whether you've got an intellectual disability you're hard of hearing um, you're female mm-hmm. you're male your multicultural um, backgrounds wh- whatever it is um, we're trying to ensure that cricket um, is a way of connecting those communities and people feeling um, you know value and purpose in, in what they do because the flow on, flow on effect from that is we build a more closer community of uh, thinking outside of cricket which is what you what you're really passionate about as well yeah absolutely so so, I mean, I think as we've got um, um, the world's got uh, more advanced, uh, we've sort of become more isolated with sort of greater tools to connect but more isolated and I think over time people will be coming back to those very things that connected communities and sporting clubs are one of those. Um, there's other mechanisms as well but yep. um, I just think it's critical that um, – we pull communities together because once you're together, you can understand the differences, the problems go away. So you're head of community yeah. cricket and all that sort of stuff. One of the things that was interesting, and Pete, um, Belinda mentioned earlier about working with Tim Nielsen, I happened to be in Sri Lanka when the Australian cricket team had just handed it across from Ricky Ponting to Michael Clark. Tim Nielsen was the coach, although the Argus report had just come out and it was very clear his tenure was very, very shaky at best and there's all this stuff going on. And I remember the late, great Tony Gregg who was commentating and we are having sort of, uh, a, a meal uh, and he was chatting and I said where, where do you see this all going Tony says look it's very clear to me that if you think about it the way it is right now you'll th- think challenge because I can tell you this I can take a, a kid from Sri Lanka from India from Australia from Bangladesh he started reeling off every country in the world they might not speak each other's language they might come from totally different backgrounds but I'll tell you what if I put a bat a ball some gloves a wiki keeping uh, set and some pads, they'll all know how to grab each other, components of that. They'll yeah. split up into teams and they'll know how to play. They might not speak each other's language. They have different backgrounds, different gifts, different talents, but they all know how to play. And I remember thinking that is cricket. Now, I know you're passionate about that, bringing people from all backgrounds, diversified mm-hmm. backgrounds, to give them the best quality experience of interacting to then hopefully bring that into other areas of their lives. Because my, my view is if you play well in a team sport like cricket, you're going to be much better in a team environment called your company or your corporation. Yep. So that's what you're kind of really saying has helped you make the shift from playing into this building and, and all the all the communities you go into. Yeah, so um, I suppose from a, um, a skill perspective, um, all the skills that I thought were critical as a cricketer, uh, which were all the physical skills have now are useless to me so the cover drive and the the pull shot whatever they're (laughs) absolutely useless that's what I spent the most time on but the bit I was lucky enough is I actually gained some other skills which have been very valuable to me in the um the rest of my life so um I always make sure kids understand that you know don't don't just focus on the physical because that stuff is useless the minute you stop playing the stuff that's useful is um is the stuff around connecting with people being able to engage being able to um, commit to a common goal and then holding yourself accountable to delivering on that. that that's the stuff that's life-changing from a sports perspective. Well, you're incredibly busy. You fly around like uh, most of us spend time on the Monash. You're sort of <laughs> flying out of, you know, you're living out of Qantas clubs and all that sort of stuff. But uh, just as we wrap up, what fills up Belinda Clark's cup outside of cricket, outside of, you know, this particular role that you have, this incredible career that you had and all those sorts of things. What fills up your cup? What do you do to sort of decompress and, and, and enjoy the other parts of life? Um, so I, uh, I have um, basic uh, rituals, I suppose, that I, I do sort of daily. Some of them are coming from sport. Others are just things that I've picked up along the way. So um, making sure your mind's clear in the middle, at the beginning of the day, you get enough sleep, um, you eat well, um, I exercise every day, I stretch every day. Um, so set myself up 
properly um, and then set some time at the end of the day to reflect on what's happened today and what have I done well and what could I do better. So they're, they're sort of like the fundamentals that follow me through the day. Um, but the thing I love doing, I love just, um, you know, walking down the beach with my partner. I love connecting with family. I've got nephews and nieces in Brisbane. I love spending time with them. So um, if it's not work, it's generally either the first bit or it's um, connecting with friends and family and just trying to switch it off and um, enjoy their company. So family, fitness and fun were some of the things you talked about at the start of this. We are talking to Belinda Clark, uh, AO, an absolute wealth of knowledge and we've just, I think, touched 1% if, mm. if, if 1% Pete, but uh, I don't know what you heard in that interview, but what I heard was get very, 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 very clear on this is not an individual game, the game of life, it's a team sport and bring your people with you and you know, part of that is bring the best of you but also finding out the best of them and you just never know where the learning is going to come from it's really interesting when you look at cricket australia and and where that where the national teams were um culturally leadership wise you know those few years ago and then you think wow you, know, you look at it now you think well it just seems like in such a good place you think yeah, how, how did right. how did they get here like very that? quick turnaround did, and then you sit down with someone like belinda clark and you go now we know i get it <laughs> now, i get it now we know why Closing up, um, finishing up now, Belinda, there's just two things, word association, either a word or a sentence and so forth. What do these things <laughs> no mean to you? No pressure here, but... What do these things mean to you? First one is culture. Um, productive. Next one is leadership. People. Love it. I think it's fair to say that we also have to thank uh, the powers of the bee at Cricket Australia. When I say the powers of the bee, that would be... Your uh, son. Our second born son. <laughs> 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 he's very convincing, that boy. He's very convincing. He gets that from his mother and yeah. his looks from his That's mother. That's why we're so nervous about getting in here and setting up. I know. Really, yeah. You've got to get he, here. You know, Belinda, is, Belinda came in here. We had a 10 o'clock um, a, a meeting. It was 10, 10 o'clock on, on and 15 the seconds. And, and Belinda comes in and goes, sorry, I think I'm a bit late. Yeah, oh, 15, 15 seconds. seconds yeah. Yeah. You're okay. So what, what our listening audience doesn't realise is that uh, when I spoke at Cricket Australia last, that was organised by my son through uh, you know, his division, uh, someone sitting right at the very front, with her journal open, taking tons of notes, probably the least likely needed to be there, less credential you know, person to hear from. She, uh, Belinda Clark sitting there with her journal open, notes taken, <laughs> was the first one there, the last one to leave, uh, grabbed a copy of uh, of my book, has probably reviewed it and given it some sort of feedback and I'm You've petrified. Got no, I've got notes it. in the margins. You've got notes in the margin, I know, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I know that to be the case. But the, the real reality is, is that uh, we had a, a family function last night for our uh, daughter's 15th birthday and Chris says, now, what time have you got the room booked? I said, from 10. He goes, what time are you from 10? He goes, no, no, no. Okay, well, I've got to fix that up. And it's like I'm thinking, okay, what are you doing? He goes, when you get around BC, you understand one thing, one thing only. Planning precedes the process. So let's get the plan right. I need to get you guys in the room, set up, ready to go, so you maximise your hour of power with it. Uh, Pete's been, from my perspective, and, and I don't ever want to say that this is one of my favourites or one of my best because it sort of just de- say it, Rick, just well, say it. degrades <laughs> some of the amazing people we've had. But... This lady is amazing, not because of the, the letters that come after her name and not because of the numbers that you know, signify her career. It's what she's looking to do next, which is to create a pathway. She's going to plant shade trees she knows she'll never sit under, but her DNA will be across so many things that happen at the top end of cricket, starting at the very basic community end. And that's something, Belinda, I think is a real gift that you give. That's why you're acknowledged. That's why you are held in such high regard. And for us, it was such a privilege to have this opportunity to interview. So if you're listening to this, watching this on our YouTube channel and you haven't shared it yet please make sure that you like, send us some feedback, we'll get it to Belinda Uh, we'll let her know if it's empowering and impactful as we think it should be and make sure that you're sharing it with your networks, your friends because as great as this information is, if it's just Peter and I getting something from it, that's that's been more than valuable for our sort of investment of time. But we want to make sure you're getting the full value of it. This is a world-class leader by any measure, but she's also a world-class person. On behalf of all of our listeners and our subscribers to Voices of Value, Belinda Clark, we wish you continued success. We expect to see you presenting the uh, the World Cup trophy to the Australian team. Oh, and yeah. if, that, if that happens, great. And if not, we'll know that they've played in the right spirit, they've done it the right way because they're led by someone who is quite passionate at what she does. Thanks, Belinda, for your time Thank and you. we appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Thank you. Belinda. It's been fun. Thank you. We trust you enjoyed listening to Voices of Value, a shared conversation between Rick Rushton, Peter Kakos and their valued guests. Their views are not necessarily those of the wider world, but they should be.
Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or your preferred podcast source. And we love to hear both your feedback and ratings on the content we provide. Additional information can be sourced through our website, voicesofvaluepodcast.com. Join the conversation again next week when Peter and Rick continue the search for truth, justice, and the value-added way.